Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's online talk, which will be starting shortly. Before we begin, please allow me to quickly show you guys a short video from our firm. I founded the firm in September 1985 with the vision of seeking truth and justice for our clients and not just winning their cases. Over the years, the team has achieved many significant milestones. We are today recognized by the Legal 500, Asia Law Profiles, and Asian Legal Business as a recommended firm in various practice areas. While we have embraced technology to make our services efficient and responsive, we continue to grow on a bedrock of meticulous preparation and hard work, for which there is really no substitute. As legal practice becomes increasingly international, we keep ourselves ahead of the curve with our relationship with lawyers from around the world. Our firm is a founding member of the League of Lawyers, a growing international network of law firms in 20 Asian and European countries. We believe in partnering with our clients to protect and grow their business. We achieve this by holding firm to our values of integrity and justice while giving our best to deliver effective and efficient solutions. Instead of just legal services, we focus on developing great working relationships based on understanding and respect. We regularly advise foreign clients, including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial solutions, often raising issues that clients may or may not have realized before. In negotiations, we believe in facilitating win-win outcomes. Thank you for watching the video. Once again, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. For today's talk, we have our partner and colleague Leslie and Jeffrey speaking on the future of sports sponsorship in Malaysia. My name is Tommy Wong and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Let me quickly introduce the firm to everyone. Mao Inquire and Associates is a mid-sized law firm that was founded in 1985 by our very Dr. Mao Inquire. Our ABLE team today comprises of 28 lawyers and 35 support staff. Dato Ma today is a consultant with the firm following his retirement from the Court of Appeal bench back in 2015. We are a full service law firm with a corporate department, dispute resolution department, which includes litigation, adjudication, and arbitration, a dedicated employment and industrial relations team, and a department focused on servicing the needs of individuals and families. Our practice groups indicate some of our focus areas, which are supported by talents from both our corporate and dispute resolution departments. Today's talk is part of our MWKA online talk series. By way of background, we have been organizing monthly lunch talks at our office since 2013, some of which were also broadcasted live. However, due to the COVID-19 MCO, we have moved online in order to continue with our objective of sharing knowledge, raising awareness and encouraging networking for clients, potential clients and in-house counsel. And today's talk would be our sixth talk in our online talk series this year in 2023. Now, before I continue, please be reminded that this talk does not constitute legal advice. And in the event you require specific legal advice pertaining to your matter or anything in relation to the sports industry, please contact us and we will be more than happy to arrange a complimentary legal consultation for you. Details will be given at the end of this talk. We have two speakers for today. We have Leslie and Jeffrey. Leslie and Jeffrey will be speaking on the future of sports sponsorship in Malaysia. Now, as a brief background, we have Ms. Leslie Lim, the head of sports, media, and entertainment and technology and esports departments in the firm. And she is very and highly experienced in general civil litigation matters and the drafting of corporate and commercial agreements. Um, in addition to her legal experience, she has a keen and strong interest in developing the area of sports law in Malaysia, as she believes that the ever-growing interaction between sports and law gives rise to the need for a special and greater understanding of the sports industry in Malaysia and those related to it. Leslie was also nominated for the Woman Lawyer of the Year in the law firm category at the 2020 and 2023 Asian Legal Business Malaysia Law Awards. 
She's a key team member of the Sports Law Practice Group at the firm, which won the Sports Law Firm of the Year Award <coughs> back in 2019 for the ALB Malaysia Law Awards. She's also the captain for the first national women's dragon boat team in the 2018 Asian Games and the 2019 SEA Games. Highly accomplished. Next up, we have Mr. Jeffrey Ong. He is a former Malaysian national swimmer who competed at two Olympics. And he is also an Asian record holder in the 1,500 meter freestyle and won an Asian Games silver medal, as well as eight gold medals at the SEA Games. He is also Malaysian Sportsman of the Year in 1988 and set the record in the 1,500 meter freestyle in 1991 that still stands to this day. And Jeffrey has worked in sports marketing as vice president and head of Malaysia, Densu Sports Asia, and also regional and commercial director for the PGA Tour and vice president of commercial partnerships for Total Sports Asia. Now for today's talk, it will encompass three talking points, which are set out in the slide above. And from here on out, I will pass the floor to Leslie and Jeffrey to commence today's presentation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Very good afternoon. Thanks, Tommy, for the very kind introduction. I see, um, just looking at the list of participants, and I see some familiar names, so I'd like to take this opportunity to give a big shout out to my Dragon Boat teammates. I see there a couple of you. I see some ASMC classmates, facilitator there as well, some familiar names, friends and all. We have together a wide range of attendees. I wish very much we were in a room together and because I can see, I think we are from a variety of backgrounds. Some of you may be here representing your company, which is considering getting involved in the sports industry, or your company may already be supporting the sports industry and is perhaps thinking of new ways to expand your brand through sports. There are also some who might be from NSAs, sports associations. You might even be here as an individual that's already involved in sports. Or maybe you're just here to learn more about sports sponsorship. So I'm very happy to share the stage today with Jeffrey Ong. I think he needs no introduction. He's a household name, very involved in sports sponsorship himself. And both of us are actually just going to have a chat about the legal and practical aspects of sports sponsorship. So in a typical lawyer fashion, I'm going to start with definition of sports sponsorship. And when we talk about sports sponsorship, basically it's a very powerful and impactful marketing technique. And if we go right to just pure definition, basically we're talking about a relationship, a collaboration, or an association formed between either a company and a brand with either a athlete, club, or association. So that's the very, very simple definition of it. And this can involve a sponsor lending their name to a brand or their name or brand to a sporting property. Or alternatively, it can be an athlete lending their image rights to a sponsor. And all this usually comes in exchange of a consideration, which basically can come in the form of monetary or goods and services. Jeff, do you have anything to add before I jump into the history of sports sponsorship? No, I think you're doing a good job so far. I'll leave it to the legal experts to make the definitions <laughs> and we'll just join in later. <laughs> sure I don't say anything wrong. No, there's a lot of lawyers around. Okay, carry on. Ken, I'll start off with the history of sports sponsorship. So historically, way back in the 1970s, sports sponsorship started with what we call A-bots, advertising boards. It was very common to see them being displayed around the perimeter of the field of play. You'll have them in the background of most sporting events. We still see that some of that today. And then eventually from the A-bots, which was static in nature, we then started seeing rolling bots where the words would roll. That obviously improved over time. We started seeing LED boards. And now we see advertisements on the field of play as well. Overseas, when it's ice hockey, logos perhaps being displayed under the ice. It's also very common to see nowadays floor stickers. So you see this either in the venue, in the competition venue, and now we even see a lot of kit sponsorships and that can come with either on the shirt, whether it's the chest, now getting more and more, which is basically on the sleeve. Some even have on the shorts and the socks as well. Now come along the digital era, which really opened up and offered way more opportunities. And um, it started off with just sports websites and we have banners of advertisements on the side that still exist today. And how the banner works is that allows the person visiting the website we have a, just a direct click to link to perhaps a purchase of goods and services. 
But what really opened up the field in sports sponsorship was social media. Because social media basically allowed the curation of personalized and tailored content on each and all the individual channels. So we'll start off with Forbes highest paid athletes in 2022. And you can see over there on the screen, the footballers dominating the first, third and fourth position. These are obviously by the millions, the top 10 over there. And here we see the full figure of what these top athletes earned last year. And the next slide, interestingly, breaks down that amount into on-field earnings and off-field earnings. And if you look carefully, you will actually see some of the athletes on this list earning more in the off-field rather than the on-field. For example, let's look at Federer. Federer earns way more off the field than he does on the field. That's a huge difference, 90 million versus 0.7 million. And how does that happen? That can come basically in ways of sponsorship, endorsement agreements, and the crux of our discussion for today. I'll go to the next slide, which is one of my favorite examples to give. Here we see on the left, Federer, and on the right, Nadal. Both have a watch sponsorship agreement. And with Federer, it's with Rolex. And if you look back at the old footage, of course, prior to his retirement, and when Federer plays a Grand Slam, and they vigorously, and upon winning the point, obviously they go to the middle of court, shake his opponent's hands, walk over to the empire, shake the empire's hands. He'll thank all four corners of the court and then he'll walk to his chair. He'll rest, probably put on his Nike jacket. That time was still Nike. He hadn't changed to Uniqlo yet. He'll reach down into his bag and he'll put on his Rolex watch. And then he'll wait for the prize giving ceremony. And as you can see right there, when he lifts the trophy, absolutely ensuring that his wrist with the watch will remain in all the pictures that will be published across the globe. In comparison, we have Rafael Nadal, my all-time favorite athlete. And you'll see right there on his wrist is a Richard Mille watch. It is specifically designed for Nadal and Nadal wears it everywhere. He wears it for practice sessions. He wears it for his first round matches, whether it's quarterfinals or the finals. It's there on his wrist. He wears it on the right because he's a left-hander. And it's specially made for him because it's very light. It's, I think it's about 20 to 30 grams. And it's only 50 pieces in the world. So here, basically, I just wanted to illustrate an example where we see two tennis players, same sport, both at the top of their games, both with watch sponsorships, but being used in perhaps different conditions. One putting on only after a victory and one wearing it all the time whenever he's on the tennis court, even off the tennis court. Just so you know, I'm genuinely talking about this watch. It's a Richard Mill watch. You can see over there, put up the price in Ringgit Malaysia. I found this on a watch website as well. Coming back closer to home shores, here we see Dato Nicole David over on the left when she was still actively competing. She was closely tied with CIMB as her main sponsor. You can see that she's wearing the brand on a headband. You often see it on her scot as well. And then as she went on towards the end of her career. And even now, we see lots of billboards, especially with AIA. And this is an example here in our local shores. Badminton, we have a huge supporter by the 100 plus brand. This is the days when Dr. Lee Chong Wei was still actively playing. And even now in the current days, here are world champion doubles players supporting, still getting the support of 100 plus. And the next one, here is a recent sponsorship deal, which the Badminton Association of Malaysia signed with Petronas. I know the CEO of the Badminton Academy of Malaysia is in the crowd today. As part of this sponsorship deal, Petronas logo will actually be displayed prominently on our national team jerseys of our badminton players. And part of the terms that was disclosed to the public included Petronas would be the title sponsor for the Malaysian Open. The Badminton Academy of Malaysia is now known as Petronas ABM. The Petronas is the official fuel partner. Basically, it means that the sponsorship includes fuel and lubricants supply. There are other Mustra products that are put in, including mineral water, hand sanitizers. And basically, Petronas' support is to help in the preparation of our national players, especially in the run-up to next year's Olympic Games. And the idea is to really contribute to the overall development program of BAM. 
And interestingly, what you see here on the picture actually is the Petronas logo actually being listed beside all the other sponsor logos as well. So you see over there from the left to the right, you've got UNX, Sunrise, BH, Healthcare, as well as 100 plus on the far end as well. Here's another example, but this one wasn't signed in the form of a contract. This was signed in the form of a MOU, which is basically a memorandum of understanding between Majlis Sukan Negara, MSN, and Alliance Malaysia Berhad, whereby Alliance is agreed to come on board and support our national para athlete program for the next three years, also in preparation for the Paris 2024 Paralympic Games. Now, one different kind of sponsorship relationship is Axiata Arena. This is Malaysia's first corporate named stadium, and it was a first naming rights agreement that we have seen in Malaysia. So here again, it's still a form of collaboration, relationship, association between, in this case, is Axiata, as well as Pabadanan Stadium Malaysia, which involved 55 million across 10 years, basically. And so to wrap up this point, basically, there are many types of sponsorships that can exist. There are also many ways that it can be phrased. It can be a title sponsor, it can be official sponsor, official partner, technical partner. Yeah, Jeff, maybe over to you. Would you be able to share? I know in the past you've advised companies and brands to sponsor sport. And could you share a bit more about your experience and why should brands invest in sports? You know, what are the benefits of that? Thank you, Leslie. And thank you, Tommy, also for the kind intro earlier on. And hi, everyone. Good to see you all joining us today. I think we have around 50 plus attendees. So thank you for taking the time to join us. Do type any comments or questions in the chat box so that we can see what you're thinking. Let us know your thoughts. We will have time for Q&A towards the end. Or maybe, Tommy and Leslie, if we have any questions that come in that we can address while the webinar is going on, we can do that as well. Yeah, I think Leslie, you've done a great job in explaining sponsorship, various types of sponsorships. There's also endorsements. There are other ways that brands can associate with athletes or venues or teams. So essentially, sponsorship is bringing together an asset, like a sports asset, a rights holder with a brand. And they have the opportunity to work together to obviously raise the profile of the brand that is associated with the sporting asset. And it's got to be a win-win arrangement, right? It's got to be something that benefits both parties. Usually it's financial. Sometimes there are other factors that an organization may want to be associated with. It may not directly be cash. It could be in kind. It could be some other value or benefit. I think if we're talking about sports sponsorship, especially in Malaysia, we have teams that get sponsored in the football league, badminton. You gave some examples earlier. We also have venues such as Axiata Arena. Individual athletes as well. They are very often ambassadors, brand ambassadors or influencers for various brands. So to me, I look at it as connecting the dots or connecting two organizations or two entities. So it could be a team, venue, or an individual athlete together with a brand and then seeing what the fit is like. How do they complement each other? And how do they amplify their presence? And it's a win-win, mutually beneficial arrangement. I think an overall sort of overview of what it's about. Um, I think one of the things that I'd like to say about sports sponsorship, as opposed to regular sponsorship or endorsements, et cetera, is that sports is quite unique in many ways because of the emotional appeal, the emotional value of being associated with sports, right? When people see Harimau Malaya playing or when they see their favorite soccer team or their favorite sports star competing, they really get emotionally involved. There's a lot of passion and it is something that you can actually tap into. And if you look at Malaysia, when we have sporting events and the general public, the rakyat goes out to support the teams or the competitors, it really brings people together. So there's a lot of harmony, there's a lot of unity, there's a sense of community. Many soccer teams, football teams, EPL teams are very passionate. You'll have certain clubs where they're really hardcore fans, other clubs, and they really don't get along with their rivals. It can actually lead to tension among family members or close friends when it comes to football matches and that sort of thing. So that's one of the big things about being involved with sports. There's the emotional element. 
And also now we see esports as well, right? Esports, gaming, there's a lot of opportunity for brands to get involved in that as well. So I hope that covers what you were asking, Leslie. Yeah, I'm going to jump in with another question, Jeff, picking off from what you said. You mentioned about connecting the two parties together. What's that process like? How would one party reach out to the other or would you be able to share a bit more about that? Certainly. It's almost like a matchmaking service. For example, you may have the rights holder or a sports asset. Let's say in this case, it is a stadium and they're looking for sponsorship to help with the costs of managing the stadium, the maintenance and operations. So they might look at partnerships, which would help benefit them. It could either be cash. For example, if you look at Exat Arena, there was a cash payment, or it could be in kind. It could be a service or a solution or a product that the venue needs, which instead of the venue paying for it themselves, someone will offer it in kind in return for some branding or some benefits like hospitality, et cetera. So it's a win-win arrangement. It can often be a direct thing. You know, there are some brands that want to be associated with a particular sports team, for example, so they may approach them directly, or they may go through an intermediary, which could be a sports marketing agency, or there could be an association that would then help them with the sponsorship arrangement with that particular club. So there's different ways to approach it, but it really is like a matchmaking service, matching the sports asset, the rights holder with the brand. So it can be direct or it could be through an intermediary. All right. Thanks so much, Jeff. I'll move on to our second talk point for today. And before yeah. I jump into image rights, I think it's quite important to perhaps understand the distinction between sponsorship and endorsement. And we spoke a lot about sponsorship and you mentioned it's about this partnership and often it is about the brand or the company speaking directly to the consumer. In contrast, an endorsement is often perhaps an athlete publicly expressing either their approval or their support for a particular product and service. So it's an athlete basically using their reputation to promote that product and service in this day and age, we call it influencer. That seems to be the popular term these days. And it usually involves an athlete that is more highly sought after. And I thought that this was quite important to understand the distinction before we move on into the second top point of image rights. And you might ask me this question, what is image rights? Again, let's go back to definition. An image rights is basically a, an individual or a company's proprietary rights which relates to their, usually it's personality. And that personality can come in the name, in the form of either name, their image, their likeness. It can even be their signature or any other indicia that is connected to that individual. So they use that, the name, image, likeness, and create a form of intangible asset, something that is of value. And then they then use that to, like I said, generate revenue. And if it's protected in the correct manner, the owner can actually prevent unauthorized use by third parties. So how can they protect, how can a party protect their image rights? This is where we look to the more legal side of things and we look at intellectual property protection and across the world, there are these six main intellectual property protection. You have trademark, copyright, patent, industrial designs, trade secrets, and geographical indications. But for sports in particular, the one that's most popularly used is trademarks. And I'll go to the next slide and we'll see why. You're going to see many familiar logos there. Not many have words to describe what they are, but the moment we see, we know uh, which company, which athlete they represent. So first row, we see the swoosh. Everyone knows it's Nike. You've got ESPN, another brand, Adidas, and Gatorade. Then the middle row are basically sports events. You see the Olympic Tokyo 2022. The final four is a basketball event. Uh, in the US. And then the last one over there is the FIFA World Cup logo. And then the last one is where, as I mentioned earlier, it's about athletes creating, using trademark to create a logo that is then associated with them. So the first one, Roger Federer, you used to be able to walk into a Nike store in the tennis section and you buy a shirt with the RF logo together with the swoosh. But now you can walk into Uniqlo. You can also purchase t-shirts, very affordable with the RF logo. Second one, Tiger Woods. Third one, CR7, Cristiano. And the last one, LeBron James. And one athlete that has utilized this really well is Cristiano Ronaldo. 
utilize his image. So he has created a whole brand and a whole set of products surrounding the CR7 brand. And here's, this is taken from his website, eyewear, footwear, underwear, fragrances. And one of the main reasons why Cristiano can do this is because he is has, he has the highest number of followers on Instagram. I just did a check. These figures are, as of last night, 571 million followers. And there are some news portals which report that Cristiano can garner up to a million for one Instagram post. So I put two examples there. One post, Cristiano can garner up to one million. So there might be instances where you may ask what happens if there is a breach by the athlete and the, maybe a company has a sponsorship agreement with a particular athlete and the athlete goes out and does something that damages not only the athlete's reputation, but it may have a knock-on effect on the brand or on the company. And often one particular clause that we see in sports contracts, they are quite unique to sports contracts, is a morality clause. And the morality clause basically governs the, the conduct of an athlete and saying that if there's any conduct that may adversely affect the image or the integrity of the association club sponsor, this can amount to a breach. And very often what we can do is we can tie it back to the code of conduct, if it's a club or an association, or you can tie it to the company's corporate image. So I've spoken a lot on the image rights, how to exploit it through trademark, intellectual property protection, how to protect it as well. Jeff, you want to jump in on image rights management? Yeah, certainly. Thanks for that. I think it's good to see some examples like Cristiano Ronaldo and the impact that one individual has. And obviously, he's a, an example that has a huge following and, and can really command a high price in terms of sponsorship and endorsements. I think when we look at athletes, it is quite unique in many ways that there is a morality clause. So again, who's the morality police? Right? There are instances where athletes may misbehave or do something. If it's a criminal act or they're arrested, or something, then that's usually fairly clear cut. But there are incidences where an athlete may be involved in something and then sponsors drop them straight away. But others, uh, in other incidents, incidences, the athlete, the brands stand by the athlete. So it's actually, Leslie, you're probably better suited to address the legality of these agreements. Again, we don't know what all the agreements entail, but in terms of this morality clause, it can be quite, it can be quite vague or ambiguous in some ways because who decides what is moral or otherwise, and it may be enshrined in the agreement. But I think in terms of endorsements for individual athletes. And I think there was a question. I'm going to just address it now. The Tio Yongju has asked as a new athlete or a young athlete, how do we seek for sponsorship? So again, just to tie this image right thing together with what we were talking about earlier about the matchmaking, it's really about bringing together the right brand with the right athlete in this case, right? So for example, if there's a certain brand that doesn't project a, a positive image for that person, they may not want to endorse that brand, right? If it's something that is a personal. So for example, some athletes will never endorse alcohol brands, tobacco, or other products that, that don't fit their image or their lifestyle. Just to try and answer that question, I don't know if I've jumped the gun, maybe we have to do Q&A at the end, but I thought since we're talking about image rights and everything, let's address it now. It's important again for that match, right? Cristiano Ronaldo has a certain image. He has a certain character is a certain personality, a certain brand, personal brand. And then the brands that align with someone like that would have, it has to be win-win for both sides. I think it's quite tricky in many ways when you're talking about, like there are cases of athletes who have breached the, these clauses, but it's up to the sponsor really to decide if they want to stick by that. Tiger Woods, one example, right? Some brands dropped him and some brands stuck, stuck with him. So I think it really depends on the in individual athlete. It depends on the terms of the agreement, but generally from a brand perspective, it has to be a good fit for both parties. And that's something to keep in mind as well for young athletes who might be wanting to sign up. I think we see a lot of Instagrammers these days, influencers endorsing brands or products and it, do your due diligence, right? Do your research. Don't just simply align yourself with a particular brand because you think it's cool or whatever. Maybe look at their background, financial records, who the shareholders are. It also can damage your brand as well as the sponsor's brand or the brand that you're endorsing. 
In the US, the National Collegiate Athletic Association used to be very strict on athletes being able to earn any money at all, but they've relaxed that ruling in the last two, three years, I believe, um, where athletes can actually earn income from endorsements or doing the influencer thing, but they still can't get paid to play their sport because that would turn them into a professional and that violates the sort of the code of ethics of the NCAA. So they're very strict on that. So again, if you're a young Malaysian athlete and you're doing any endorsements or you're sponsored by someone, by a brand here, financially, if you get a scholarship to a US college, it, it can actually turn around and bite you because if they find out, you can, I know athletes who have gone to the US from other countries and they accepted pay or funds from a sponsor or a team sponsor or whatever. And when it was, when it came to light, they were actually suspended or they had punished, they were punished. So something to keep in mind, because I know we have like young golfers, we have young perhaps tennis players, et cetera, who might want sponsorship now, but when they go to college, if they get a scholarship to the US, just be very careful that what the rules are in that respect. I studied in America, I trained there. So I know a bit about it. This was 30 years ago. So things have changed, but it's just something to keep in mind as well, especially for young athletes in addressing this question that we had just now. This must Thanks. be way after the Dumex days, uh, Jeff. <laughs> Let's see, I'd retired by then. <laughs> so I was a Dumex kid, but I'd already retired. So there was no conflict. Thanks for the insight. I think to add on to a question earlier, with your experience, Jeff, how would you then advise new and young athletes on the manners in which that they can use to build their image and brand? since they are up and coming all the way to, to seek for sponsors anyway? I think, yeah, that's a very good question, Tommy. Thanks for asking. And again, anyone else who is in the audience would like to ask any questions or comment, you can use the Q&A function or type it in the chat box. We'll do our best to answer your questions during the time that we have. I think the most important thing is, for example, if you're in a sport that requires equipment, if you can get your equipment sponsored, as in you get the equipment for free, but you're not paid to use the equipment, that could help defray or offset your costs, right? If, you know, for example, tennis equipment, football boots, football gear. I don't, again, know the exact restrictions or regulations that the NCAA has. This is just purely from a college scholarship perspective. But just do your research on if any of you young athletes or the parents of young athletes who are thinking of sending their kids to the US or, or hoping they get scholarships before they, while they're still in school, while they're still competing here, do your research and just check what you can and can't do in terms of receiving any equipment, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of, again, just for young athletes who might want to look for sponsorship, the easiest, not the easiest, the most straightforward way is who is in your network? Who, anyone that you know, like their parents of other swimmers or athletes who maybe are with a company that might be willing to sponsor your team or the individual or, or whatever it is, Start looking within your network, asking around, hey, so-and-so needs to go to this tournament. They need funding. Maybe you, you, you can do like a fundraising activity or get certain things sponsored. I know some, sometimes like companies will sponsor uh, shirts or jerseys for their school or club teams. Uh, and then outside of that, what else is a good fit for your brand, your personal brand? For example, if you like a certain apparel manufacturer, one of the brands that makes a sports apparel, you could always approach them directly and say, I love your product. I'd love to be able to partner with you somehow and be sponsored by you. You can supply my kit for free. And, uh, and then in return, obviously, I'll be wearing it and all that. Again, anyone going for college scholarships needs to check uh, what you can and can't do. But yeah, I think that was a good question, Tommy. It can be quite a lengthy discussion, so I don't want to spend too long on it. But I thought that would be a good description of what one should keep in mind, especially if you're a young athlete. Hey, Jeff, imagine with me this process, because you've spoken in quite bits of parts. So you spoke first about matchmaking the two parties together. Once you find the right fit, I'm summarizing what you said, matchmaking, finding the right fit. And once both parties come to terms, obviously from the legal perspective, we advise that to be put in writing. And if it involves a minor, you obviously should get your guardian, your parents involved. And so relationship takes off. And we spoke about what can parties do to optimize that relationship. Now, how do parties measure how well the relationship is doing? Bigger brands, companies will want to see, or be able to calculate their ROI, basically, their return of investment. How would we go about that? That's a very good question. And I think 
at the end of the day, many years ago, many companies, I'll use Malaysia as an example, many companies would be persuaded to sponsor out of national service, right? Hey, we have this tournament, sponsor la, help us out. And I think that that was great. A lot of it's about building the community or grassroots development, et cetera, et cetera. And there wasn't so much ROI, so much of a question of measuring the ROI. Now everything is ROI. Everything is data. Everything is metrics. Everything is what can we do? To, what do we get out of it? Basically, And I think that's what everyone asks, right? Even the athletes, what do I get out of it? If Cristiano Ronaldo is approached by a brand, he'll look at what he gets, how much he gets paid, what does he have to do in return? It's a two-way street. But I think what is important is that from a sponsor's perspective, and I know we have some people who are much better versed in measuring ROI and sponsorship in our audience today. I'd love to hear from yourselves as well. But essentially, it's not just here you go, here's some money, wear my shirt and off you go. There's always certain metrics or they want to get something out of it. So I think from both sides, from the sponsor's perspective, how do they measure that? And that depends on what they want to get out of it. If it's eyeballs on ads or signage or whatever it is, if it's social media posts, like you mentioned, Leslie, how many likes, how many shares, how many new followers, et cetera, what's the engagement? And that all can be measured using social media and digital tools. And then from the brand, uh, sorry, from the athlete side or the team, the venue, what, how do they provide that information? If the sponsor is not like measuring it themselves, they want to know something, but they're not, they might ask you to provide how many engagements have you had? How much interaction do you have with your followers? You may have to screenshot or share that as well. So lots of questions coming in and comments. Uh, great stuff. Everyone keep it coming. I was going to see if we want to take one or two. Jeff, it seems to be quite related to what we're discussing now. Yeah. And Angelia Ong asked about sponsorship and endorsements. And she asked, what are the legal considerations if negotiating for those who are minors? A lot of the brands, et cetera, for the examples given tend to be for those past the age of 18. Yes, you're right. What advice could be given to parents, coaches, or managers, or the athletes themselves before they begin this search, legal ramifications, sports rules, et cetera? So I think the first main legal consideration when it comes to minors is that the minors are not allowed to sign the contracts themselves. If they are below the age of 18, guardians and parents will need to sign on their behalf. From the legal perspective, that will be the main, uh, my main answer. And I think that the others which Jeff already mentioned, associating with the appropriate brand, obviously, I think the biggest ones that you probably have a light bulb is alcohol, cigarettes. And the questions that we have been, we, the firm have been receiving a lot lately is actually from the, what if betting companies want to get involved? And these are the few categories I think that should perhaps need a little bit more attention and this doesn't just apply to minor athletes. I think this applies to senior athletes as well. The second half of your question, I think perhaps maybe Jeff, you might be more suited to, to take this. What advice could be given to parents, coaches, managers before they begin this search? Although I believe you answered it just now a little bit. Yeah, uh, thanks. And just full disclosure, it's related to me. She's my sister. So <laughs> thanks for asking, asking that question. She's a very established swimming coach. Shout out to Leah for asking this. I think she does work with a lot of young athletes, young swimmers especially. So this is really pertinent for Leah and, and other parents and anyone else in this group who might be wondering this as well. Really good question. I, again, it's just the most important thing is what is the what are the rules governing your sport, your association that you're under? And again, if that for example, if they're looking at scholarships overseas, like NCAA, what are the regulations that you need to be aware of? Again, the brand association we talked about, obviously alcohol, not under 18 and tobacco, et cetera. But yeah, I think most, most importantly is what, what do your values as an athlete, what brands align with those values or what, how can you align with that brand? Because brand messaging and the brand impact is more important, more if effective and impactful if it is very much aligned, right? If there's a certain product that doesn't fit your brand or vice versa, it may not be the right match, like matchmaking, right? It's, like a, it's almost like a relationship or a marriage, right? Matching the two. So again, I think in terms of advice, start off with what you can and can't do, what brands, et cetera, what kind of sponsorship or endorsements that the athlete can do. And then the next one is which brands align with your personal brand. That's very important as well. So we have a couple more questions coming in, but I'll leave it to Leslie and Tommy to move on. I don't know if we're going to 
and on to more questions or just go through? Uh, I think we can move on with final talk point first before we then round up with all the questions to be addressed at the end. Yeah, sounds good. And so we're going to jump to the last talk point for today. And basically just speaking about the impact of technology on sponsorship. And Jeff, actually my question to you just now is already and going towards this point because if you recall in the earlier part, I was sharing about the history of advertising sports sponsorship and how in the early days with a boards and display of brands the question would always be how many eyeballs saw my brand and of course now social media as we say has changed the landscape with the curated content etc we've got metrics and algorithms coming into play to justify that spending can you give any other examples where we see technology and its impact on sports sponsorship yeah i think esports is a great example right so the exciting thing about esports in terms of sponsorship is typically in conventional sports, you would need to go through, for example, the club, the association that governs that sport that the club participates in, et cetera. There could be a lot of rules and regulations. With esports, the rights holder is usually the game publisher or the game developer, right? So that you know you don't need to go through associations and federations, et cetera. You can go straight to the source, as it were. We've seen in the last few years an explosion of in-game marketing, right? In-game product placement, in-game branding for partners. And again, we may have esports practitioners or experts in here who could probably address this better than me. And I think this makes it an exciting field, pardon the pun, to be in or exciting arena in terms of getting your brand in the esports, either the game or in tournaments etc. Or even in the masses playing the games. The difference between esports and gaming, for those who are unaware, gaming is like when you're just playing a game online or electronically, right? Esports is a tournament where there's actual competitions and there are teams playing against each other or individuals competing against each other. Gaming is a huge market worldwide. Think of all the people who play games on their phones or on their devices. But esports is, is a slightly different kettle of fish or quite a different kettle of fish, actually. But again, the opportunities for in-game product placement, branding, et cetera, and also in esports tournaments or esports competitions, you can, there's a lot of opportunity. So technology is changing the, the landscape in terms of, again, like you talked about digital brand uh, on the field or on the court, et cetera. I think Leslie, you've got some more info on this. So maybe you want to run through that. Yeah, sure. So I've, yeah, I've taken the liberty of preparing some slides, particularly on esports, and I've got a, a couple more answers to that question as well. Tell me next slide. So yeah, just very briefly for the benefit of our participants. So I've put together some slides just to show some stats relating to esports. And here is the global player forecast. And we see 2022, it's obviously on the rise and they expect it to continue rising to 2025 at 3,000 over a million players globally. Very interestingly, 55% of the chart is occupied by Asia Pacific, right where we are today. And in the global games market last year, mobile games, in fact, dominated. I'm sure all of us have seen many people always on their phone playing mobile games, very popular ones in Malaysia, Mobile Legends, PUBG, Shin Impact. And again, when we look at the global games market, it's 49% in Asia Pacific, dominating compared to all the other regions. Now, if we look at the share of the gaming online urban population here in Malaysia, 70% women 80% men when it comes to mobile gaming, still high percentages, men slightly dominating more. But the most interesting fact on the far right side is that Malaysia is the third largest in Southeast Asia with an estimated value of $786 million. I've just put together some examples where you see sponsors, brands that we know getting involved in the esports arena as well. And here's 7-Eleven with one of the online games in North American Rocket League Championship Series. Here is FaZe Clan and NFL, which as we know is American football. So we see an esports team collaborating with what we call traditional sports over in the US. One sport, Semi collaborating with HSBC, well-known brand, Bank. So Twitch is a streaming platform, very popular. Those of you who have not been on Twitch before, go on it after this. And what you'll see is streamers streaming usually their gameplay, any games that you like. Lately, I've been going to check out the Hogwarts Legacy, which just released. And some of the very popular streamers, and when they tie up with sponsors, what is on the side of their screen, perhaps like over here, they will publish the brands of the sponsors that they are affiliated to. 
But very interestingly, I just putting on this slide as stats that I got as of April 2022, top sportswear brands. Again, you would think in our mind, Nike, Adidas, Puma, these are brands that liars or more popularly known in the traditional sports, but these are gaining popularity on Twitch in the esports arena again as well. Wrapping up my last two slides, this is MLB, Mobile Legends, and they are going to set up an esports hub in Malacca, in the middle of Malacca town. And here's a picture of the hotel that they intend to build in Malacca in the years to come. I think we're almost done with the slides. To add on the impact of technology in sports and sponsorship, I suppose in general, what we see is also more tech and crypto companies getting involved as sponsors in sports as well. I think crypto.com signed an agreement with FIFA to become the exclusive cryptocurrency trading platform for last year's Qatar World Cup. And over here in the Malaysian side of things, we see Safi Sali, our footballer, actually creating his own personal NFT. He's obviously announced his retirement lately, but he's one of those that has really gone down that path of technology, embracing NFT and taking that step down that road. One more example of how technology has come into play. I just wanted to share this. Very recently, FIBA, the Federation of International Basketball, they are going to debut glass LED basketball surfaces. Usually basketball surfaces need to be a certain wood, comply with the specs, etc. Now, this new one is going to be made of glass with LED underneath it. And basically what's going to happen with that is that the entire basketball court, the glass, the flooring, not only is it going to demarcate the feel of play with the lines and all, but the whole thing becomes like a massive display board, massive monitor that can display anything it can be simple axes and crosses on the floor to point where the players are. It can be displaying the sponsor's brand. It can be playing a video on the floor. It literally can do anything. And that really shows one example of how technology is just going to open up the playing field and give this opportunity to offer more lucrative sponsorship opportunities, basically. So yeah, Jeff, anything to add before I think we can... I believe, Tommy, we're going to move on to Q&A soon. I think it's fantastic that we have all these new opportunities for branding and engagement with fans. But I also think it's a bit distracting when you have too many things on the court. Or, <laughs> like or, a or, true or something flashes up here and then some light <laughs> goes here and something flies across the screen. It's what Did they pass? What happened? I'm a bit old school, so I like more traditional things sometimes. Keep it simple, but... Of course, we know every, everyone's got to get revenue. So I think it's fantastic that they're innovating and come up with new things. But I just wonder, you know, are we going to have the field completely covered in or the court com covered in logos and all kinds of things? I don't know. The jury is out. So I'll leave it. I'll leave it to the experts. But I, I'm, I just think sometimes it's a bit too much. But maybe that's because I'm quite old school. And Tommy, I think that's all for our presentation. Maybe we can start taking questions. All right. Thank you very much, Jeffrey and Leslie, for the wonderful insight. We have a lot of questions being posed in the Q&A chat. So let's begin with, I believe we have addressed Yongju and Angelia's questions. So I think the next one we can go to is Farid Yunus, who's actually asked, what can a person do if a sponsor doesn't pay up or satisfy his, their contractual obligations? <laughs> Before we go down there, in order to take steps or take an action against a sponsor who doesn't pay up, you need to establish that there is a legal relationship between the two parties. And although Malaysian law recognizes both written and verbal contracts, our advice is, of course, to crystallize that relationship into a form of a written agreement. And then because if a sponsor doesn't pay up and you want to take steps and action against the sponsor, you can go back to that written contract where the terms are all clearly stated and then perhaps take the action to court for breach of contract. Thanks, Leslie. We can move on to the next question from Daniel. One question that he has is that motorsports is inherently expensive and many talents rely on sponsorship to progress or even survive with many of those making it coming from wealthy families. Given that most Malaysian businesses aren't in a position to sponsor the value required to allow a driver to progress, how would you suggest local athletes or sports management agencies to approach international businesses or organizations for sponsorship? And if so, are there any tax breaks for Malaysian businesses investing in local athletes? It's quite a lengthy question. Um, 
Leslie, would you like to take this question? Let me just have a read. I was going to take the next one on the tax breaks. Given that most Malaysians are in a position to sponsor the value required to allow a driver to suggest approach. Jeff, maybe I think this might be more suited for you though. How would local athletes and agencies approach international businesses for sponsorship? I'll take the next one on the tax breaks. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Thanks for the question there or questions. I think that Again, it's a matchmaking thing, right? It's not just, and again, what I'd like to say is if an athlete or a brand, sorry, a team or a, anyone with a sports asset or the image rights or a personal brand wants to get sponsorship, it's not just go to someone and say, hey, give me money, right? Because it, it's not the right way to approach someone. It's like, how can we work together? Or how can we help each other out? Or how can we partner together? Uh, I'm interested in partnering with your brand how can we work out something that's win-win for both of us? I think in terms of international businesses, and again, it depends on your brand or let's say a young athlete, driver, et cetera. If you want to go overseas and, and compete or train, and, and again, be very clear what you're going for, how much it's estimated to cost, and be prepared to keep all receipts, documentation, et cetera, right? Again, the ROI thing comes into play. Then I think it's really about finding the right fit. It's the matchmaking thing. So you can approach intermediaries, agencies, et cetera, to help you. A lot of times it's not easy. I know when I was at Dentsu Sports, we did manage some athletes. And sometimes it's very easy to match them with brands. Sometimes it's not. Or brands would approach and they're not the right fit or whatever. So I think you have to be very specific in what you're looking for. And again, if you have a brand or an international business that you'd like to be associated with, that you see there's a good fit, then write that case study, write the rationale why that brand should work with you. Put it in writing. Even if you don't send it to them, when you meet with them, you get a meeting with them, then you know you can go through that. It's like the benefit for them. What's in it for them? What do they get out of it? So I think always think from a brand's perspective, what are they going to get out of it? How do they benefit from the partnership instead of give me some money kind of thing? We, some of you may know Jerry Maguire. The, uh, there was a movie back in the 90s you know, show me the money, right? It was like, get money. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, show me the benefits of a mutually beneficial partnership. Show me what I get out of it. So you have to think of the brand, what they are going to get out of it. Not just, I'm going to give you some money. But that's a very simplistic way to look at it. But I hope that helps you, Dan. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the next question. And in addition, are there any tax breaks in Malaysia for Malaysian companies investing in local athletes? Then re recently we've had a change of government and a new, minister, a new youth and sports minister and the minister held several town hall sessions, which I'm sure many of our participants attended as well. And there was a resounding call or request for some form of a tax relief in hopes that this would entice sponsors to get more involved in supporting the sports industry. And the good news is that when the budget 2023 was announced in early March, it did include a tax relief particularly for, to encourage the involvement of the private sector into sports and to top up and to, to make parties hopefully a little happier. The government even announced that they are going to provide a matching grant of 50 million for unity-based sports and national level competitions. However, that's the general announcement that has been made in terms of the, the details what are the criteria to get the matching grant, how to apply for the tax relief, etc. Those details have not been released as of yet. I don't believe so. But the good news is it has been announced under the budget and I suppose we will be seeing more details about it perhaps in the weeks and months to come. So maybe something to look out for in the news. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks, Jeff. I think that was a very detailed response to Daniel's question. We are running short on time, so I think we have just a few more questions that we can take to address. I'll begin with one from Tasha. Social media is one of the main arenas where sponsors and brands will gravitate towards. A lot of young athletes do not realize the implications of how they conduct themselves online. What would be good advice towards social media education for these young athletes? I think this sort of ties in back with image right management. And I think, Jeff, you have the vast experience in that area. So I'll allow you to address this. The good news is when I was competing, there was no social media. So I didn't get into trouble for posting anything because I was nothing to post. It's a, probably a blessing in many ways, but that's a really good question, Tasha. I think, again, it's that brand fit, but also for me, it's about your reputation. It's about your, you personally, how you behave. And I think it's very easy 
for young athletes to maybe get in the heat of the moment or they say something when they're very emotional or say something reactive and it may hurt them in the long run. You know, I think it's really about managing your own personal brand and thinking about when you post anything online, just think who's going to see it. It could be anyone, right? Think carefully, think thrice or even more times before you post anything. Can I reword it differently? Should I post it at all? What can I say that could make it a bit different? I think that's actually a very good question. And a lot of young athletes may not realize the ramifications of what they're posting online. It could be there forever. Like you could post something when you're 15 and then when you're 25, it comes back to haunt you perhaps. I don't know if this is the right thing to do, but perhaps have a private account on social media, which is not your name. It's just like something like a nickname or something uh, that doesn't really describe you and use that for the fun social stuff you post or share with your friends. And then have your official one, your official Instagram or Facebook or TikTok or whatever account, which is your name. And that's the brand that you want the world to see. That's what you would like to present to sponsors or to, to the general public. I think there's no right or wrong. There's no black and white solution or answer. It's just really I think carefully. And if in doubt, leave it out. If you're not sure whether you should post it, don't post. Either wait for one or two days or just don't post it at all because it could have a detrimental effect on you and your reputation. Thank you, Jeff. I think we can take one last question before we have to conclude. So oh, let's I'd, I'd be keen to, to take as many as we can, Tommy. I don't want any of the participants to feel like we ignored their questions. All right. Let's, let's run. run. Yeah. So we, Catherine has, a, has two questions, so I'll, I'll read them all together. Leslie mentioned brands like betting company in relation to sourcing sponsorship funds. Would that perhaps be the reason why our Serpunk F1 event is no longer organized due to difficulty in sourcing suitable sponsors? And Serpunk F1 is a good revenue source for Malaysia, promotes tourism as well. So it is a pity that it no longer exists for the country. What are your thoughts on this? If you have anything to say, I have quite a short answer to this, actually. Okay. Yeah, maybe your answer might be better. Yeah, why don't you go ahead, Leslie, and I'll add on if there's anything. Yeah, unfortunately, it's hard to answer why F1 is no longer organized. The benefit of working on some of the agreements in the early years of my career related to Formula One, and it's a pity that we don't see it anymore in Malaysia. But as to why it's no longer organized, I think only SIC can answer that question. Um, obviously, we know there are relations to the perhaps the government side of things and I don't think we are the appropriate party to answer this question. It that no longer exists definitely it is important that we continue to have this sort of events, venues, arenas because this is what is going to help develop sports in Malaysia. Without the existence of these events and venues and sports is going to be stunted. So yes it's a pity. And yes, we need more of this. Yeah, I'll just add on very quickly that I think those are good questions, but I think the answers are far more complicated than Leslie or myself could address because when it comes to countries hosting or cities hosting international competitions like Formula One, there's a lot at play. It's not just about sponsorship. It's about political will, the country's direction, the country's image, what they're trying to project or portray the financial implications, the costs, and what the ROI is. So I think it's a lot more complicated than, than we're able to understand. So if anyone here works with SIC, please feel free to answer in the chat box. We'd love to hear from you. Mm -hmm. Cassandra just added, the cost of F1 was rising too significantly as compared to the cost of tickets. And of course, probably with the, the cost of sponsorship. And then Dan says they wanted to fund MotoGP instead. Again, that could be political will. That could be the direction the country wants to take. So yeah. those are good points. Anyway, moving on to another question from Tanya Teo. How does it work with the sponsorship contracts when matchmaking brands and athletes from different countries and or regions? Which country's law should be practiced? The companies or the athletes? Thanks. Okay. Leslie, you may want to take this. Great question, Tanya. One that's often asked by many of our clients as well because as they consider cross-border relationships. And the short answer is that which country's law should apply and which forum for dispute resolution is part and parcel of the negotiation process. Obviously, when we go on board, we always often advocate for Malaysia's laws to be applied and for the forum for dispute resolution to be here in Malaysia. And that could be 
either through the courts or through the court of arbitration for sport. And what I think many may not be aware of is that Kuala Lumpur, under the AIAC, the Asian International Arbitration Centre, is in fact an alternative hearing centre for CAS, the Court of Arbitration for Sports. And what that basically means is if you have a dispute and your agreement provides that it should be resolved through CAS as the uh, jurisdiction, you can apply for it to be heard here in Kuala Lumpur without having to go all the way to Lausanne in Switzerland. So I hope that answers your question, Tanya. I think before we wrap up, we can take one last question. Tying to the subject of contracts, I think Robin has asked a question. It is common for brands to restrict athletes from using products from competing brands during sponsorship. Is such a restriction enforceable in Malaysia? I think, Leslie, perhaps you can take this as well. Yes, it's common to see such clauses simply because when a sponsor comes on board and has a tie-up with an athlete, obviously, you don't want the athlete to be going around and promoting a different brand or a competing brand as well. So yes, it's often that we see such clauses being included, but it all depends on the terms that are agreed upon and then how that is crystallized into the agreement. I'll take Federer as an example. Federer has been with Nike for many years and towards the end of his agreement, if I recall from memory, he wanted to, he was considering to let his contract with Nike expire. Obviously, we don't know whether he was already talking to Uniqlo and whatnot. And then what we knew is that in the media after that, he announced that he was going to shift to Uniqlo as his attire sponsor. But there was no restriction in terms of his shoes. And so he actually continued to use Nike shoes as he continued playing while wearing Uniqlo clothes. Already in this kind of situation, I hope you can imagine with me, Robin, that it depends on how the agreement is phrased even if you want to restrict the athlete in some sense, you can find a way to draft how you want to ring fence that relationship or how broad you want to open it up. So if it is crystallized into a contract, then the short answer is yes, such a restriction would be enforceable in Malaysia. Thank you, Leslie. We are running very short on time. So thank you very much again, Leslie and Jeff, for the wonderful insight on the future of sports sponsorship in Malaysia. This was a very insightful session. And if the participants, if any of you would like to have your questions addressed, if we did not and, and were not able to, please send over an email and our speakers can address it accordingly. So before we conclude, I have a few announcements to make. Firstly, please join us again for our upcoming talk on eviction on, of squatters know your legal rights as a landowner. It will be held on the 19th of April, 2023, and it will be hosted by Vivian and our colleague JJ. Secondly, please fill in our feedback form and tell us what you thought about our talk. The link to the form will be posted in the chat. Thirdly, kindly follow our Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook accounts. We regularly post updates on our legal insights and events there. Fourthly, if you'd like to speak to any of our lawyers, we offer a complimentary 30-minute consultation over the telephone or over video conference. Please fill in the form on our website. The link is posted in the chat box. And to our guests, thank you for joining us today. We hope you have found today's session insightful and informative and useful. So thank you, everyone, and hope to see you at our next talk. Enjoy and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining.